Pisa tests students between 15 years and 3 months to 16 years and 2 months at the time of the assessment in maths, reading and science. Also, who are enrolled in school and have completed at least 6 years of formal schooling, regardless of the type of institution in which they are enrolled, and whether they are in full-time or part-time education, whether they attend academic or vocational programs, and whether they attend public or private schools or foreign schools within the country. The Programme for International Student Assessment PISA, tests educational systems from countries in the Organisation for Economic Cooperation and Development. OECD. There are two fundamental requirements to become an OECD member. Be a democratic society committed to rule of law and protection of human rights. Have open, transparent and free market economies. This eighth round of testing was done in 2022 instead of the scheduled 2021 because of the COVID pandemic. Studies from Australia, Canada, Denmark and Switzerland show students who performed better in PISA at age 15 were more likely to attain higher levels of education by the age of 25. The education at a glance in 2021, generally speaking, found those with higher education are more likely employed with higher salaries and live longer. Correlation, not necessarily causation. 15 years old because it is when young people in most OECD countries are nearing the end of compulsory education. With around 100 countries or economies taking part, it gives PISA a unique scope. Some 690,000 students took part in the assessment in 2022, representing about 29 million 15-year-olds in the schools of the 81 countries and economies that took part in 2022 anyway. PISA is financed exclusively through direct contributions from the participating countries and economies, government authorities, typically education ministries. But that does mean it costs to take part with the international and national expenses shared on their website. PISA uses multiple choice testing as the primary feature of its assessments because it is reliable, efficient, and supports robust and scientific analysis. Computer-based tests were used in most countries and economies in PISA 2022, with assessments lasting a total of two hours for each student. The assessment of financial literacy was offered again in PISA 2022 as an optional computer-based test. But multi-choice tests have limitations. Students also answer a background questionnaire providing information about themselves, their attitudes to learning, and their homes. These included a questionnaire for teachers asking about themselves and their teaching practices, and a questionnaire for parents asking them to provide information about their perceptions of and involvement in their child's school and learning. There is so much data involved in a PISA report, but there is certainly more information that could be taken considering all of the nuances and caveats and other subjects. However, despite the many limitations people could call on, I still think the data is worth looking at. The PISA test is designed to provide an assessment of performance at the system or country level. It is not designed to produce scores for individual students, so it's not necessary for each student to receive exactly the same set of test items. No standardised tests. In PISA 2022, most students took an hour-long sequence of mathematics questions combined with an hour of either reading, science or creative thinking questions. A small proportion of students took a combination of reading, science or creative thinking questions. At the moment, there are two published volumes, but as they are both very long reads, I'm only going to cover the information of interest for me from volume one in this video. Those being the UK system or England's system, then other popular systems, so Australia, the US and Canada, and other high ranking systems in the various metrics that are measured. So a lot, but not a lot, considering the 81 countries or Economies that took part in 2022 with all the various metrics. Now there were some technical limitations to the 2022 assessment, the most obvious being access to computers. Standard testing is planned for the upcoming 2025 PISA assessment. The OECD strives to identify what policies and practices appear to be working in countries and economies that are recording high performance or show evidence of significant improvement over the time on PISA. It then reports those findings and supports countries and economies that wish to investigate and explore the extent to which they would benefit from similar programs. One person describing the so-called algorithm of PISA improvement run a set of education systems. 
measure the outcomes, compare the systems, let worse systems learn from better systems by copying the solutions, go back to step one. This person going on to say, we cannot effectively measure the outcomes and we cannot provide a single formula for all individuals. I think trying to emphasize that the best system depends on the metrics measured. So the best education system depends on the context, the context of the educators, of the learners, and of the learning environment and experiences as a whole. For context here, the OECD Compass framework is what they try and encourage other educational systems to follow for most students. The industrial the industrial form of schooling meant that students were often expected to be passive participants in classrooms. But with the rapidly evolving landscape, there is a need to rethink the goals of education and the competencies students need to thrive. The aim of this compass is to help find answers to questions like, what knowledge, skills, attitudes and values will today's students need to thrive in and shape their world? How can instructional systems develop these knowledge, skills, attitudes and values effectively? A compass was used as a metaphor to emphasize the need for students to learn to navigate by themselves through unfamiliar contexts and find their direction in a meaningful and responsible way, instead of simply receiving instructions or directions from their teachers, looking for and encouraging student agency. Student agency does not mean student autonomy or student choice. Student agency is thus defined as the capacity to set a goal, reflect, and act responsibly to effect change. It is about acting rather than being acted upon, shaping rather than being shaped, and making responsible decisions and choices rather than accepting those determined by others. But as the OECD says, there is no global consensus on the definition of student agency. As for the compass, it is not an assessment framework or curriculum framework. It is a product of government representatives, academic experts, school leaders, teachers, students, and social partners, using well-being of society as a shared destination. So, the OECD Learning Compass 2030 is an evolving framework in that it will be refined over time by the wider community of interested stakeholders. Going on to add, learning doesn't only happen in school. And for me, that is where this framework has potential power because it goes outside of of school and educators can use it basically anywhere. Looking at the compass in more detail, there are core foundations which the OECD define as the fundamental conditions and core skills, knowledge, attitudes and values that are prerequisites for further learning across the entire curriculum. These foundations being split into cognitive foundations which include literacy and numeracy upon which digital literacy and data literacy can be built, health foundations including physical and mental health and well-being, social and emotional foundations including moral and and ethics. These core foundations are the building blocks upon which context-specific competencies for 2030, such as financial literacy, global competency, or media literacy, can be developed. How educators include these core foundations in the curriculum is a long conversation, but this ties in with the transformative competencies in the next part of the compass. A competency is a holistic concept that includes knowledge, skills, attitudes, and values. Skills are a prerequisite for exercising a competency. So you develop skills alongside attitudes and knowledge to become competent at something. They wrote, Students need to be able to use their knowledge, skills, attitudes, and values to act in coherent and responsible ways that change the future for the better. Going on to add, competency and knowledge are neither competing nor mutually exclusive concepts. And the compass identify three transformative competencies. Creating new value means innovating to shape better lives, such as creating new jobs, businesses and services, and developing new knowledge, insights, ideas, techniques, strategies and solutions, and applying them to problems both old and new. Questioning the status quo or thinking outside of the box. Reconciling tensions and dilemmas means taking into account the many interactions and interrelations between seemingly contradictory or incompatible ideas, logics, and positions, and considering the results of actions from both short and long-term perspectives. Gain deeper understanding of opposing positions to find practical solutions to conflicts. Taking responsibility 
It's connected to the ability to reflect upon and evaluate one's own actions in light of one's experience and education and by considering personal, ethical and social goals. It is argued that these competencies are needed more in societies that continue to become more diverse and more interdependent as they develop. And all of this should be done through R. The Anticipation Action Reflection AAR, cycle is an iterative learning process whereby learners continuously improve their thinking and act intentionally and responsibly, moving over time towards long-term goals and contribute to collective well-being. As this is a cycle, you would think there is no starting point, but this starts at A, the anticipation phase. Learners use their abilities to anticipate the short and long-term consequences of actions, understand their own intentions and the intentions of others, and widen their own and others' perspectives. To me, this is appropriate planning, and then to action. An action, in itself, may be neutral, yet could result in anything from very positive to very negative outcomes for the individual, society, or the planet. It is therefore important that actions taken are both intentional and responsible, hence the need for anticipation prior to the action, and for reflection following the action. That last bit I'm not so sure about because it is a cycle, but then we get to the what came first, the chicken or the egg, so I'm just going to go with it. Reflection is a systematic, rigorous, disciplined way of thinking with its roots in scientific inquiry, where learners improve their thinking and deepen their understanding, improving their ability to align future actions with shared values and intentions, and to adapt successfully to changing conditions. This compass framework is used to help students find their way. Documentation shows a well-being goal figure from the OECD, then some development goals from the United Nations. When looked at side by side, you can see the overlap, most of those goals being a bit too much for any individual student, but students who graduate from compulsory education without acquiring basic knowledge and skills are unlikely to do well in their adult life, which is what the Compass Framework is looking to help with, and when a large share of the population lacks basic skills, social and economic capital can be compromised. And I think that is where the bigger, broader goals can be used if we think of students less as individuals and more as a group or society. Some people argue that the PISA tests are unfair because they may confront students with problems they have not encountered in school. But then life is unfair, because the real test in life is not whether we can remember what we learned at school, but whether we will be able to solve problems that we can't possibly anticipate today. That sounds like much of the critiques you see online about current education and schooling systems. If all we do is teach our children what we know, they might remember enough to follow in our footsteps, but if they learn how to learn and are able to think for themselves and work with others, they can go anywhere they want. Which to me sounds like what most educators are looking for or want. The skills spoken about are defined as the ability and capacity to carry out processes and be able to use one's knowledge in a responsible way to achieve a goal. Cognitive and metacognitive skills, which include critical thinking, creative thinking, learning to learn and self-regulation. Social and emotional skills, which include empathy, self-efficacy, responsibility and collaboration. Practical and physical skills, which include using new information and communication technology devices. When talking about knowledge, it includes theoretical concepts and ideas as well as practical understanding based on the experience of having performed certain tasks. Disciplinary knowledge includes subject-specific concepts and detailed content. Interdisciplinary knowledge involves relating the concepts and content of one discipline or subject to the concepts and content of other disciplines or subjects. Epistemic knowledge is the understanding of how expert practitioners of disciplines work and think, helping students find the purpose of learning, understand the application of learning, and extend their disciplinary knowledge. Procedural knowledge is the understanding of how something is done, the series of steps or actions taken to accomplish a goal. For attitudes and values, they refer to the principles and beliefs that influence one's choices, judgments, behaviours and actions on the path towards individual, societal and environmental well-being. Personal values are associated with who one is as a person and how one wishes to define and lead a meaningful life and meet one's goals. Social values relate to those principles and beliefs that influence the quality of interpersonal relationships. They include how one behaves towards others and how one manages interactions, including conflict. Societal values define the priorities of cultures and societies. 
He shared principles and guidelines that framed this social order and institutional life. Human values have much in common with societal values, however, they are defined as transcending nations and cultures. They apply to the well-being of humanity. These values can be identified across spiritual texts and indigenous traditions spanning generations. They are often articulated in internationally agreed conventions, such as the Universal Declaration of Human Rights and the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals, SDGs. But does that all actually happen in the OECD countries tested in PISA? Well, that is what the assessment is for. So volume one of the 2022 PISA assessment report was the state of learning and equity in education. Those wanting a pretty picture and summary, students' math reading and science results got worse. But there is a lot more to that story. Now, confusion can be added when you start looking into the data and different interpretations. This worldwide fact map, for example, says the UK average score was 486.3, putting us ranked 20 below the US. But when you look at the PISA scores, 489 plus 494 plus 500 is 1,483, divided by 3, and you get 494.3, putting us 15th above the US. And yes, 465 plus 504 plus 499 is 1,468, divided by 3 is 489.3, so the US number is accurate. But the UK one isn't for some reason. It seems that Belgium have had the reverse, 1,459 divided by 3 is 486.3, so maybe the UK and Belgium scores were mixed up somehow? I have no idea what happened there, but I'm just pointing out that when you look at data and interpretations, including this video, make sure you check the original sources, which is obviously linked in the description. Much of the data reported in the PISA 2022 report was what most educators would have could have guessed. We should keep schools open longer for more students, prepare students for autonomous learning, build strong foundations for learning and well-being for all students, limit the distractions caused by using digital devices in class, strengthen school family partnerships and keep parents involved in student learning, delay the age at selection into different education programs, provide additional support to struggling students instead of requiring them to repeat a grade, ensure adequate high quality education staff and materials, establish schools as hubs for social interaction, combine school or autonomy and quality assurance mechanisms. Sounds easy. Uh, now, PISA did focus on maths as their main subject. Yes, a limitation. But a spokesperson talking about maths said, In 22, PISA focused on mathematics. And since PISA is not a traditional test of math knowledge, let me briefly explain what students were expected to do. To do well, students had to demonstrate more than to remember, you know, mathematical uh, routines and formulas and equations. They had to show that they could think like a mathematician. They had to look at problems from the real world and translate them into the world of mathematics. They had to solve those problems with mathematical concepts and then interpret solutions back in the real world. No? And countries had agreed in advance on the relative importance of those aspects. No? Some of the problems involved quantitative reasoning, things like number sense and judging interpretations, arguments based on quantity. Other problems were about statistics and data. So students had to form and evaluate conclusions drawn in situations with some uncertainty. Still other tasks involved change in relationships, common in math, and some are about space in shape or geometry. And the problems were framed in a variety of contexts, you know, from the personal through the social up to the scientific. And uh, solving them correctly also required some cross-cutting 21st century skills like critical thinking, like creativity. A little later in the presentation, talking about math reasoning. The kind of mathematical reasoning that you need today is actually quite different from what was sufficient in 20, 2003. You know, some things got a lot easier, you know, technology has digitized mathematical routines, but other things got harder. You know, if you want to understand climate change or a pandemic, you need to have a good understanding of exponentials and be able to distinguish single signal from noise and things in terms of think in terms of probabilities. But the trouble is that across OECD countries, and the same is true for the US, PISA shows that the mathematics skills of 15 year olds have not progressed over the last two decades. And in fact, since 2018, they have dropped sharply by 15 points on average across OECD countries. If you think that 20 points is a school year, you know, you get a sense of the magnitude of that drop. Artificial intelligence and the digitalization of education was emphasized a lot. But even though most countries saw a decline in results, 
some countries bucked the trend. The good thing is that there is a good group of countries that have bucked that trend and seen good progress over the last decades. And those countries show us what's possible. Now you can see, you know, how Singapore has moved from good to great and it's kept advancing even in the middle of the pandemic. Or you look at, you know, Macau or Japan or Estonia moving forward. Portugal and Israel also saw good progress, so they fell back recently. Turkey saw some considerable progress and was at the same time able to get a lot more students enrolled in school. At the lower end of the performance spectrum, you can see how Qatar achieved remarkable progress. Peru and Colombia also advanced. And then Brazil is another of those countries that expanded access to opportunity and raised quality at the very same time. And these are just some examples of the countries with progress. Another caveat before diving deeper into the numbers, there were some countries or economies that didn't hit the typical standards expected in PISA testing, and they were due to overall exclusion rate, school response rate, student response rate. And those countries and economies were identified by an asterisk next to their name. This volume discusses only statistically significant differences or changes. Set to 5%, but significance can be a very cloudy thing. The Rapisa report uses three benchmarks for interpreting test score differences. A large change is 20 score points. This is approximately equivalent to the typical annual learning gain by students around the age of 15. So a 20 point drop is about a student falling a year behind. Small differences and differences that are medium or large is 10 score points. Then there are those that have statistical uncertainty intrinsic to PISA indicators. Countries or economies whose results do not differ significantly between two consecutive assessments are classified as having stable results. When we look at student performance, PISA considers a mathematically proficient person to be someone who can mathematically reason their way through complex real life problems and find solutions by formulating, employing and interpreting mathematics. So not just memorizing Pythagoras or balancing quadratic equations. Reading proficiency is defined as follows. Reading literacy is understanding, using, evaluating, reflecting on, and engaging with text in order to achieve one's goals, to develop one's knowledge and potential, and to participate in society. Reading in the 21st century involves not only the printed page, but electronic formats, i.e. digital reading. It requires triangulating different sources, navigating through ambiguity, distinguishing between fact and opinion, and constructing knowledge. Which sounds much like the journalistic, academic, scientific, media, literacy sort of competencies many people online are pushing for. Me included. A scientifically proficient person, therefore, is willing to engage in reasoned discourse about science and technology, which requires the competencies of explaining phenomena scientifically recognizing, offering, and evaluating explanations for a large range of natural and technological phenomena, evaluating and designing scientific inquiry, describing and appraising scientific investigations and proposing ways of addressing questions scientifically, interpreting data and evidence scientifically, analyzing and evaluating data, claims, and arguments in a variety of representations and drawing appropriate scientific conclusions. Basically, going beyond your gut reaction to whatever information. An average of 69% of students are at least basically proficient in mathematics in OECD countries. During PISA 2022, the mathematics scale is divided into eight proficiency levels. Proficiency level two is considered the baseline. Use mathematics in simple, real-life situations. This is item two, question two, from the assessment with a difficulty of proficiency level two. Refer to the triangular pattern on the right and click on a choice to answer the question. If Alex were to extend the pattern to a fifth row, what would be the percentage of blue triangles in all five rows of the pattern? Pause if you want to give it a go. I wanted to get to the number, so I counted 10 red and 6 blue, then added 5 red and 4 blue to make 15 red and 10 blue. 10 blue over the total 25 as a percentage, I wasn't sure, so divided by 5 to get 2 over 5, then doubled to get 4 over 10, which is 40%. But you could have also just said 40% because there are less blue triangles than red triangles and all the other answers are above 50%, but that was just me. And yes, I was right, yay, I'm proficient at mathematics. Eight proficiency levels used in the PISA 2022 reading assessment. This graph showing the spread. 
with seven proficiency levels used in the PISA 2022 science assessment. This graph showing the spread. If you want to, you can go to the report and go to Annex C, I think page 375 onwards, and you can find all of the questions in there. And about three out of four students have achieved basic proficiency in reading and science in OECD countries. But when we look at the points performance, the OECD average dropped by almost 15 points in mathematics and about 10 score points in reading compared to PISA 2018. 31 countries and economies managed to at least maintain their performance in mathematics since PISA 2018, but Australia, Japan, Korea, Singapore and Switzerland maintained or further raised already high levels of student performance. When looking at those education systems, common features including shorter school closures, fewer obstacles to remote learning, and continuing teachers and parental support. I think educators' assumptions confirmed by the data. Now, the overall average did drop, but I think it's worth noting that the report said the decline can only partially be attributed to the COVID-19 pandemic. In these subjects, performance peaked in 2012 and 2009 respectively before dipping. This indicates that longer term issues are also at play. So performance was already dropping. There are lots of other factors which some I'll discuss later, but it was emphasized that teacher support is particularly important in times of disruption. One in five students overall reported that they only received extra help from teachers in some mathematics lessons in 2022. Around 8% never or almost never received additional support. Now again, I want to emphasize nuance and caveats because this is a lot of average data being put together, but it does show that there are students not getting the support that you could arguably say they should be getting. Parental involvement in students' learning at school decreased substantially between 2018 and 2022, which was something that struck me as odd considering the amount of parents at home during the lockdowns. Students who enjoy more support from their families reported a greater sense of belonging at school and life satisfaction, and more confidence in their capacity for self-directed learning. Some things that sound really small playing a big role, for example. Higher performing students reported that their family regularly, about once or twice a week, or every day or almost every day, eats the main meal together, spends time just talking with them, or asks them what they did in school that day. These students scored 16 to 28 points higher in mathematics than students who reported that their family does not do those things regularly, on average across OECD countries, and after accounting for students' and schools' socioeconomic profile. So, Overall, education systems with positive trends in parental engagement in student learning between 2018 and 2022 showed greater stability or improvement in mathematics performance. Parents helping children is good, but while there is no doubt as to the importance of parental and family engagement in education, there is an ongoing debate on the appropriate balance and nature of their involvement especially beyond children's early years. These results showing that, for adolescents, even seemingly innocuous activities like sharing a family meal or just talking together are strongly associated with student performance and well-being. But as I'll discuss later, food isn't actually a simple topic. When we look at the performance snapshot and focus on mean scores in 2022, you can see the UK, Canada and Australia have all three subjects above the OECD average, but the US are behind in mathematics. Looking at the national and sub-national level, Canada still at the top, but then England, Australia, Northern Ireland, Scotland, Wales, then the US for mathematics, reading Canada and US at the top, followed by Australia, then England, Scotland, Northern Ireland, and Wales, science, Canada at the top, followed by Australia, England, US, Northern Ireland, Scotland, then Wales. I'm also taking note of Singapore, Japan, Korea, and Estonia because each subject has over 500 points. They must be doing something right for the PISA assessment, at least. Singapore scored significantly higher on average than all other countries and economies that participated in PISA 2022. But, as I mentioned earlier, we cannot provide a single formula for all individuals. So a copy and paste of their system to other places in the world won't necessarily work, but that doesn't mean we can't use parts of their system, which is related to a point I'll mention later on, maybe a timestamp somewhere. Now, mathematics anxiety is particularly high among countries or economies with low levels of performance in mathematics. 
somewhat expected, but nice to see the data confirming it. Also finding that a growth mindset can help with performance anxiety. A growth mindset as opposed to a fixed mindset is the belief in the malleability of ability and intelligence, and is one possible explanation why some people fulfill their potential while others do not. PISA 2022 asked students whether they agreed, strongly disagree, disagree, agree, or strongly agree, with the following statement. Your intelligence is something about you that you can't change very much. Students strongly disagreeing or disagreeing with the statement are considered to have a growth mindset. A little bit too shallow for my liking when it comes to measuring and methods of testing, but it's still something I would take note of, especially when considering the term used later as resilient students, or for resilient students. When it comes to investment in education, we see a positive relationship between investment in education and average performance up to a threshold of 75,000 USD PPP, purchasing power parity, in cumulative spending per student from age 6 to 15. Just under 60k in pounds, but that means there is no relationship between extra investment and student performance over the threshold. And countries like Korea and Singapore have demonstrated that it is possible to establish a top tier education system even when starting from a relatively low income level. So more money over the threshold doesn't necessarily help. This was a point raised on a panel discussion. Equity in educational opportunity. Take the US and look at the performance gap between the students from the third most disadvantaged decile and the wealthiest families. This is a large gap. But then look at how comparably disadvantaged students in Switzerland have math skills that match an average performer almost in the US. And when you look at the most disadvantaged students in Macau, you see they almost reach the performance of the most privileged students in the US. And that tells us that poverty need not be destiny, that students from all social backgrounds can actually reach high performance standards in the right conditions. Now, in closing, that opportunity gap is the greatest promise, really, of a good education. If you come from a wealthy family, you know, you'll always find open doors in life. But if you come from a disadvantaged family, you often have just one single chance in life, and that is, you know, find a great teacher and a good school. If you miss that boat, you often don't get a second chance. Trend analysis shows that the socioeconomic gap in student performance widened very little over the last decade, on average in the OECD zone. However, in eight countries or economies, the gap has grown, seven of which are European. Estonia, Finland, the Netherlands, Norway, Romania, Sweden and Switzerland, and the non-European economy is Macau. China. Estonia catching my eye here because it was one of the top four in performance ranking. It is not an improvement in advantaged student performance, but rather a decline in the performance of their less privileged counterparts. So the investment gap in performance is widening due to the disadvantaged declining in performance, which is where equity in education is important. Namely, that all students, regardless of background, are given a fair chance to reach their full potential. But socioeconomic status was and is one of the biggest predictors of performance. Socioeconomically advantaged students scored 93 points more in mathematics than disadvantaged students on average across OECD countries. About 15% of the variation in mathematics performance on average across OECD countries can be attributed to students' economic, social and cultural background. While socioeconomic status remains a significant predictor of performance, Canada, Denmark, Finland, Hong Kong, China, Ireland, Japan, Korea, Latvia, Macau, China, and the United Kingdom are highly equitable by PISA's standards. Now, other metrics were measured. Educational disparities linked to gender, immigration status, geographical location, example, urban versus rural areas, disabilities and other student background characteristics have gained visibility as sources of inequity in education, enrollment and learning. As I believe meanings are in people rather than words, I feel like this section may bring some more clarity to what they mean by equity. Equity in education does not mean that all students should achieve the same results. Indeed, some degree of variation in student results is to be expected in any education system, even those with high levels of equity. The goal of equity-orientated policies is not to curtail the academic achievement of top-performing students, nor dumb down education systems so that they produce homogenous outcomes. Instead, equity-orientated policies should help all students become the best version of themselves. Which is why only education systems that combine high levels of fairness and inclusion are considered highly equitable. 
later on going to say, in a fair education system, students learning outcomes would be independent of background circumstances such as their family or socioeconomic status, immigration background or gender, because these are circumstances over which students have no control. But the report does recognize that students whose parents have higher levels of education and more prestigious and better paid jobs benefit from a wider range of financial, example, private tutoring, computers, books, cultural, example, extended vocabulary, time management skills, and social, example, role models and networks, resources. Highlighting that when comparing students, there will be those that are disadvantaged, and disadvantaged students are more likely to repeat grades and enroll in upper secondary vocational rather than general programs. They are also less likely to expect to complete a post-secondary degree which when looking back at the education at a glance report could explain why those disadvantaged are more likely unemployed, getting lower pay or don't live as long. Again, emphasizing the importance of equity in education. Boys outperformed girls in mathematics by nine score points and girls outperformed boys in reading by 24 score points on average across OECD countries. In science, the performance difference between boys and girls is not significant. But non-immigrant students scored 29 points more than immigrant students in mathematics on average across OECD countries, but non-immigrant students scored only 5 points more than immigrant students once socioeconomic status and language spoken at home had been accounted for. Which to me suggests when language spoken at home and socioeconomic status is balanced, the performance is pretty much the same. Potential room for policy or practice reassessment, you may think. Looking at the snapshot of socioeconomic disparities and academic performance focusing on math performance variance and disadvantaged students with resilience, we see Canada and the UK are in the top half of the table above the OECD average for both metrics. Australia and the US both below in both metrics. For gender gap metrics, Australia, Canada and the UK are above the average for all subjects, the US again below on mathematics. For me, somewhat solidifying Canada above the UK and Australia slightly below and then the US below them for the four main countries that I'm looking at anyway. A report saying socioeconomic status is a broad concept that aims to capture students' access to family resources, i.e. economic capital, social capital and cultural capital and the social position of the student's family or household. That is where the ESCS comes from in the data. Economic, social, and cultural status. ESCS is a composite score that combines into a single score information from three components. Parents' highest level of education, parents' highest occupational status, and home possessions, which is a proxy for family wealth. More information will be released about the technical descriptions in the technical report planned later on, but this index helps us to look at the data. Interestingly finding, countries and economies with higher levels of fairness by socioeconomic status are not often those with strong student performance. Looking at this very lovely figure, we can see those with below average math performance down the bottom and below average socioeconomic fairness to the left. The bottom right grid being the many countries or economies with above average socioeconomic status but below average performance. Macau and Hong Kong in China seemingly doing very well other countries in the top right following suit. Socioeconomically disadvantaged students are seven times more likely than advantaged students to score below level two in mathematics on average across OECD countries. When it comes to reading and science, the odds of low performance are also more than five times higher for disadvantaged students compared to their advantaged peers on average across OECD countries. But PISA look at academically resilient students as well. Academically resilient students are defined in PISA as students who are in the bottom quarter of the PISA index for economic, social and cultural status ESCS, in their own country or economy but scored in the top quarter in that country or economy. On average across OECD countries 10% of disadvantaged students scored in the top quarter of mathematics performance in their own countries and thus can be considered academically resilient. Looking at the data, the UK are high, followed by Canada, the US, then below the OECD average is Australia. I think this is worth pointing out because disadvantage doesn't necessarily mean low performance. But there was some data with the food inequality metric that I was surprised at. 
The number of food insecure people in 2023 is about 1.14 billion. Personal income, food prices, and economic inequality are among the major factors affecting people's ability to access food. But there was 8.2% of students reported not eating at least once a week in the past 30 days because there was not enough money to buy food. And here we go. There are OECD countries where the proportion of students suffering from food insecurity exceed 10% including the United Kingdom, 10.5%, Lithuania, 11%, the United States, 13%, Chile, 13.1%, Colombia, 13.3%, New Zealand, 14.1%, and Turkey, 19.3%. And in 18 countries or economies, more than 20% of students reported not eating at least once a week due to the lack of money. But in some countries, food is part of the core curriculum. In Finland, school meals are an integral part of the national core curriculum. National legislation guarantees students from pre-primary through upper secondary education the right to free meals on school days. In Ireland, the school meals program provide funding for the provision of needs-based meals for students and children in schools and organisations. The data shown in this graph has some expected results but still very worrying. Now, taking a step back to the gender disparity, disparities in performance at age 15 may have long-term consequences for girls and boys' personal and professional future. The underrepresentation of girls among top performers in science and mathematics can partly explain the persistent gender gap in careers in science, technology, engineering, and mathematics STEM fields, which are often among the highest paying occupations. Again, I'm going to emphasize nuance here. Correlation doesn't necessarily mean causation. And gender differences in achievement are not explained by innate ability. Instead, social and cultural contexts reinforce stereotypical attitudes and behaviors that, in turn, are associated with gender differences in student performance. For example, boys are significantly more likely than girls to be disengaged from school, get lower marks, repeat grades, and play video games in their free time. Whereas, girls tend to behave better in class, get higher marks, spend more time doing homework, and read for enjoyment, particularly complex texts such as fiction in their free time, which would probably explain the drastic point difference between boys and girls with reading and math. Girls are also less likely to repeat grades, but girls are more likely than boys to feel anxious about mathematics. For the math scores, you can see the boys scored higher than girls. For the reading scores, you can see the girls scoring higher than boys. But when considering all of this data and looking at the people creating policies, they need to consider a question like, do they focus on the students? or the schools. This suggested policy framework looks to help with that question. The strength of the socioeconomic gradient, i.e. the proportion of the variation in student performance that is accounted for by difference in student socioeconomic status, goes from low on the left to high on the right. The slope of the socioeconomic gradient, i.e. the score point difference in student performance associated with an increase of one unit in the PISA index of socioeconomic status, goes from flat on the bottom to steep on the top. Put together, we can see this figure. The UK and US falling in universal policies, but Australia and Canada falling in performance targeted policies. Universal policies are more appropriate in education systems where student socioeconomic status does not have a great impact on student performance. Universal policies aim to improve performance across the board and raise educational attainment for all children through reforms that are applied equally across the system. Whereas, targeted policies are those that focus on particular groups of students, focus resources and efforts on low-performing students, performance targeted, or socioeconomically disadvantaged students, socioeconomically targeted, or both. Mixed. Canada and Australia forming in the performance targeted, looking to raise the lower performance. But PISA results show that it remains a challenge for education systems to create school environments that are accepting of diversity, multiculturalism, and immigrant students. Now, when looking at comparing countries, it is important to keep the national wealth of countries in mind when interpreting the performance of education systems across countries. While per capita GDP reflects the potential resources available for education in each country, it does not directly measure the financial resources actually invested in education. So when looking at this figure, I personally would look at each country's investment of funds into education before making any interpretations. But 
As mentioned earlier, we see a positive relationship between investment in education and average performance up to a threshold of USD 75,000 PPP in cumulative spending per student from age 6 to 15. Then, as I think you would expect, countries with more highly educated adults are at an advantage over countries where parents have less education. According to this analysis, the share of tertiary educated 35 to 44 year olds accounts for 57% of the variation in 15 year old students mean mathematics performance across 42 countries or economies with available data. And when looking at the figure, we can see as the percentage of tertiary education adults goes up, moving to the right, the mean score in math also goes up. Now, having said all of that, 2022 was the year of technology in education. Now, digital devices in education has two sides of the conversation, which I've discussed before, but Pisa said students encountered fewer problems during remote learning tended to score higher in mathematics than other systems. When technology is used for learning, the relationship between the hours technology is used and math performance is largely flat. But when technology is used for leisure, you can see steeply declining learning outcomes. So, you know, students using their own smartphones for their own things in school is generally associated with poor outcomes. Students who spent up to one hour per day on digital devices for learning activities in school scored 14 points higher in mathematics than students who spent no time. However, remote learning left many students struggling to motivate themselves. During the pandemic, students had to learn on their own. And so we asked students about their confidence in self-directed learning, as well as their self-motivation. And as you can see here, American students feel quite confident in using video communication programs, but they think they will have trouble motivating themselves to learn if schools close again. You know, on that score, students in the US are not that strong. Results suggest that providing students with the skills to use technical tools for learning is not enough. Students also need to learn how to assume responsibility for their learning. Going on to add, students who reported that they become distracted by other students who are using digital devices in at least some math lessons scored 15 points lower than students who reported that this never or almost never happens. When looking at the data, around 30% of students on average across OECD countries reported that in most or every mathematics lesson, they get distracted using digital devices. Around 25% of students indicated that in most or every lesson, they become distracted by other students who are using digital devices. However, like I mentioned on my previous video about phone bans, at first glance, cell phone bans would appear to be a useful policy. However, further research is needed to fully understand the effectiveness and impact of such bans. On average, across OECD countries, 30% of students in schools where the use of cell phones is banned reported using a smartphone several times a day, and 21% reported using one every day or almost every day at school. So the blanket bans are hard to enforce. Results also show that in some countries or economies, when cell phones are banned at their school, students are less likely to turn off their notifications from social networks and apps on their digital devices when going to sleep at night. Which, when considering student well-being, brings in parents and the home environment back into the conversation. In addition, students who spend up to one hour per day on digital devices for learning activities in school scored 24 points higher in mathematics than students who spent no time on such devices on average across OECD countries. And this positive relationship is observed in over half of the education systems with available data. However, the relationship becomes negative when students spend more than one hour per day on digital devices for learning in school. Where this gets interesting to me is that students who spend up to one hour per day on digital devices for leisure activities scored 20 points higher in mathematics than students who spend no time on such devices. So, these findings suggest that moderate use of digital devices is not intrinsically harmful and can even be positively associated with performance. 
mirroring what I said in my past video. It is the overuse and or misuse of digital devices that is negatively associated with performance. But something that could be new to educators is the idea of blended learning, which happens in Singapore. A reminder, Singapore ranking number one significantly higher than all of the other countries or economies. Blended learning, regular home-based learning, HBL days, have been implemented in all secondary schools and pre-university institutions since the end of 2022. Regular HBL days provide students with more opportunities to learn curricular content in a self-directed manner, using both digital and non-digital methods of learning. HBL days also include time to set aside for student-initiated learning, where students can pursue their own interests and learn outside the curriculum, such as learning a foreign language or studying financial literacy or programming. In Singapore, there are two HBL days a month as part of the school schedule, which accounts for 10% of curriculum time in an academic year. The time is split. Around four to five hours are allocated to the curriculum and at least one hour is dedicated to student-initiated learning. Schools determine these subjects and topics covered on HBL days and customize the support for student-initiated learning based on their students' interests and needs. The Singapore Student Learning Space is a national online program which has been rolled out for all secondary students under the National Digital Literacy Program, which supports this blended learning. And there was something new I found out when reading this, and that was students who require additional learning support or who do not have a home environment that is conducive to learning can return to school on HBL days where they will be supervised by school personnel, but will still have the opportunity to learn and organize their schedule independently. Thinking back to student agency and what was mentioned in the compass, this is something I think policymakers could be looking at to implement in other systems. Just, just an idea. Then there is time in school. The earlier students are selected into different academic programs, the greater the isolation of advantaged and disadvantaged students in the education system. This makes me think about the, the relative age effect, the Matthew effect, the Galatea effect, Pygmalion effect, and all the other social grouping effects. And this is important because classmates and schoolmates can have a strong influence on one another, i.e. peer effects, for better and for worse. And education systems with more grade repetition tend to show lower average performance in mathematics. Now, data cannot establish causality. But, on average, across OECD countries and in a majority of education systems, students who had attended pre-primary school for at least one year were considerably less likely to have repeated a grade at any education level than students who had never attended pre-primary school or had attended for less than a year, even after accounting for socio-economic factors. Suggesting that getting children into early years education is important, but that isn't always easy, especially when you consider finances. I'm thinking about the UK and England right now. But when looking at teacher support, in half of all countries or economies, and on average across OECD countries, teacher support deteriorated between 2012 and 2022. Again, considering nuance and context here, Principals were more concerned about the shortage of education staff in 2022 than in 2018, with the report saying, It is important for education systems to examine why principals in 2022 perceived a greater shortage of teachers when the number of teachers per student had not necessarily decreased. Workload being the word that springs to my mind. Of course, this report is average, so there could be some countries that are not getting many teachers in and getting more teachers going out, which obviously really isn't good. And results show that socioeconomically disadvantaged schools were more likely than advantaged schools to suffer from shortages of material resources. Again, emphasizing the importance of equity in education systems. It is important to ensure that all schools, regardless of their socioeconomic profile, enjoy adequate and quality educational material and digital resources. Something I was surprised by was that in high performing education systems, schools tend to provide a room where students can do their homework and school staff offer help with homework. Students in school that provide a room to do homework scored 13 points higher in mathematics than students in schools that do not provide such a room. So homework being done at school instead of at home, kind of like 
after lesson work. In addition to the performance increase, an increase in the availability of peer-to-peer -peer tutoring is associated with an increase in students' sense of belonging at school. And these results highlight the importance of social interaction for students' learning and well-being. When looking at some examples, more than half of the curriculum in Estonia, Kazakhstan and Korea involves collaborative learning. Estonia and Korea being two of the four top performing countries according to the ranking. Now, student agency is discussed in the compass and throughout this piece of document, but school autonomy is also discussed in this report, saying the greater the autonomy granted to schools in an education system, the higher the average mathematics performance, and this is most evident when education authorities and schools had certain quality assurance mechanisms in place. For those in England, that would be Ofsted, and I did a video about that situation recently. The idea is to assess the quality assurance of teacher mentoring arrangements, monitoring teacher practice and having inspectors observe classes, schools systematic recording of students, test results and graduation rates, internal or self-evaluations, tracking achievement data by an administrative authority, and using mandatory standardized tests at least once a year. And these assessments also relate to safety in school. Now, of course, there's a lot of variability in this. Now, students in Switzerland and Austria feel particularly safe. Students in Jamaica, in Cambodia, particularly unsafe. And the US too is somewhere below the OECD average. Overall, students feel safe at school, particularly in their classrooms. However, PISA 2022 results suggest that education systems could consider improving safety on the routes students travel to or from school, or in places outside of the classroom, such as hallways, cafeterias, or restrooms. Again, emphasizing nuance because behavior and safety reports vary drastically across countries and within countries. But in Portugal, the Social Without Bullying, School Without Violence Plan 2019 emphasizes a whole community approach to combating bullying and school violence, with actions aimed at teachers, parents, students, and other stakeholders. What you can see in many high-performing education systems, teachers may have larger class classes than in the US, but they typically teach fewer hours, so they actually have more time to do other things than teaching. They are not just great instructors, they are great coaches, great mentors, good facilitators, good evaluators, great designers of innovative learning environments, good social workers. So if you go to Japan, you know, if students get in trouble with the police, actually the police are going to call their teachers, not their parents. So that, that students the teachers know who their students are. They know, you know, who they want to become and they, they accompany them on their individual journey. And then the instruction, you can be uh, so, uh, not surprised that disciplinary climate is very strong. The student sense of belonging is strong. And those are the ingredients for actually good outcomes. Now, learning is never a transactional business. It's always a social, a relational process. Students feeling safe or unsafe probably being one of the reasons for school absence. And attendance has become a big issue since the pandemic. And as was presented, Finally, we looked at student absenteeism, and while this has got a little better than 2018, it's still an issue in many countries. Now, what's interesting here is that the third most common reason that students cited for long-term absenteeism was that they were simply bored. We should certainly be able to do something about that. And for me, this is where teacher quality, teacher materials, and teacher education becomes central to students actually wanting to or understanding the reasons to turn up to school. Uh, but this is the, the key message, that actually the resources that appear to matter most for um, performance in general are actually those related <coughs> to teachers. Uh, these are results we know from, from experiments, we know from, from the literature. Um, if you look to the left-hand side, it's actually uh, teachers, teaching staff, we see that it is, there is a clear negative relationship. This is after controlling for socioeconomic profile. There is a clear negative relationship between shortage and um, of um, teaching staff and mathematics performance. But when we go to educational material, actually the results are no longer significant. So teaching staff is the most, uh, the most strongly associated. Then we have assisting staff, then we have educational material. And when we go to infrastructure or when we go to um, uh, digital resources, we actually see no relationship emphasizing the importance of having teachers in school, shining a light on this previous comment. Principals were more concerned about the shortage of education staff in 2022 than in 2018. Now in the UK, 
Reading is on the rise, math slightly declining, science is drastically dropping, so doing expected or better on average. But something I wanted to point out, 54% of students in the United Kingdom were in schools whose principal reported that the school's capacity to provide instruction is hindered by a lack of teaching staff, and 19% by inadequate or poorly qualified teaching staff. In the US, despite the poor declining math results, reading and science are both on the rise, suggesting what they are doing is better. But 42% of students in the United States were in schools whose principal reported that the school's capacity to provide instruction is hindered by a lack of teaching staff, and 18% by inadequate or poorly qualified teaching staff. Australia's performance doesn't look too good with all the subjects declining, but I think that is partly due to other countries improving as Australia are still in the top 20. 61% reporting lack of teaching staff, and 27% by inadequate or poorly qualified teaching staff. Canada's performance telling a very similar story to Australia, but still very high in the rankings. Well above the average for all of the subjects, but 44% reporting lack of teaching staff, and 24% by inadequate or poorly qualified teaching staff. And when looking at the top four ranked countries in the PISA report for performance, for Singapore, it was 26% and 8% respectively, Japan, 64% and 43% respectively, Korea, 51% and 16% respectively, and Estonia, like what, 73% and 51% respectively. So somehow, these top performing countries or economies are outperforming others when they want more teaching staff and they have inadequate teaching. There are lots of possibilities here, but there is a comment that I want to emphasize. Learning doesn't only happen in school. With the rapidly evolving educational landscape, there is a so-called race between technology and education. Computers, including artificial intelligence, are not as good as humans at abstract tasks, manual tasks, tasks requiring complex contextual information, and using tasks requiring ethical judgments. They are, however, good at routine, manual, non-routine, manual, and routine cognitive tasks. Due, in part, to these changes, the nature of work has also changed over the past half century. Online education and internet resources are part of education and increasing in their influence in education, <laughs> and they're not going away anytime soon. Some entrepreneurs consider the purpose of business to be not solely for making profits, but for creating social value and solving society's most urgent problems. The change in the work really needing to be reflected in a change in education. To turn this vision into reality, everyone needs to take action, to move from the division of labour to shared responsibility. Everyone needs to have the skills, knowledge and the desire to contribute. Coming from the OECD framework, a sense of shared responsibility for the education system and stakeholder engagement has also evolved. Decision making is no longer controlled by a select group of people, rather it is shared among stakeholders of the education system, example, parents, employers, communities and students. But of course, Challenges are also emerging. The use of big data threatens individual privacy, and the easy manipulation and creation of false data and stories, aided by digitalization and social media, has spawned fake news and a post-truth era. This is where the role of students in the education system is changing from participants in the classroom learning by listening to directions of teachers with emerging autonomy to active participants with both student agency and co-agency, in particular with teacher agency, who also shape the classroom environments. As one person said. And I think the biggest challenge that we have in, in public education is, is having to deal with the political issues or the, the side no, the noise that happens on the side that distracts us from really coming together and focusing on the priorities that we need to focus on. And that's this collective effort of just make, giving all kids an opportunity to thrive in uh, the 21st century. And then there is. Um, our kids can't learn if they are hungry, if they are um, don't know where they're going to sleep at night, um, if they don't feel safe in their communities. So we have to address all of the systems that are contributing to these challenges. Um, and, you know, 
we sometimes uh, in this policy space, when we talk about resource equity, we're talking about money and that's the end of the sentence, but it's money and a lot of other things. This data is telling us that we need highly qualified, highly supported and valued teachers that we not only do we need digital equity in terms of making sure our students have access to devices and connections, but our teachers also need professional learning so that then they can teach digital literacy so that our students can learn how to use their devices for leisure in a positive way, how to use them for learning. They need safe buildings, et cetera, et cetera. There's um, so much that we need. I think that our investment during the pandemic and for our recovery was essential and that as we continue in this time, we need to protect all of those investments because they're helping us get toward that, right? They're helping our students get connected at home and at school. They're helping us hire more teachers, extend learning time and make sure that our districts can do innovative things like take the time to listen to students, to lessen the workload of a teacher so that they can focus on the things that really matter. And as the OECD have said, the paradigm has shifted so that the environment is viewed as a larger ecological system. I don't think the OECD is referring to the ecological approach I've briefly mentioned before, but it does emphasize the importance that it is more than just a school and a student and a teacher. It is society as, a, and as an entire environment that plays a role in the education system. Now, education is a complex, never-ending topic of discussions and debates, which is kind of the point of making this channel. But my main takeaway points from this report is that we need more and better, however you define better, teachers, and a better understanding of what this digitalization really means for education in school and education inside of adult learning as well, so pedagogy and andragogy. I have seen the Gen Z conversation that went on TikTok and then moved over to YouTube about teachers commenting on current education. Obviously, PISA is 15 year olds. So anyone younger than 15, i.e. 10 years old and below, which is where a lot of that conversation leads to, I don't know of much of the data or reports around those people and the comments that are made. So I'm waiting for either the education at a glance to come out for 2023 or any other reports that happen. And I will be keeping an eye on the 2025 report, but obviously got a few years to wait for that one. I do want to say a thank you to everyone inside of the Discord for ongoing conversations about all of this and anything else that we talk about and the people that engage inside of the peer review before this video went live. If you want to engage, there will be a link in the description below.